Good afternoon. I'll take the, take the mask off. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to English today. It's good to see you. Good to be with you. And whether you're here in person or watching online or listening on CD, I pray, I pray God's richest blessing on you all today as we meet to worship God together. So, firstly, just to say that the Reverend Dodds and the family are currently isolating due to COVID. But uh, having spoken to him, they're they're thankful that to have only suffered mild uh, symptoms and they expect to be out and about again in the next day or two. But we're grateful that Reverend Ivan Ferris has at short notice been able to come in to lead our service today. So Ivan, you're very welcome. Uh, it's really good to see you again and thanks for joining us. So we look forward to hearing what the Lord has led you to say this afternoon. So just to highlight a few announcements, um, so firstly this week there's been updated guidance from the Clerk of the General Assembly around the easing of some restrictions in, in place for COVID-19. So effective immediately, uh, face coverings may now be removed when members of the congregation are seated at a, at a service of worship, Bible study or prayer meeting. Uh, face coverings, however, must continue to be worn when singing when entering, moving around or leaving the church, unless, of course, you're exempt from doing so. So just to repeat, uh, feel free to remove face coverings, masks when seated, but they still need to be worn when singing, entering, uh, walking uh, around and leaving the church building. So then uh, we meet this Wednesday uh, on the 2nd of February at 8 p.m. here in English for our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting and you're all very much encouraged to come along. And finally then, just on, on Thursday morning, our uh, prayer fellowship meet at uh, 9.30 a.m. in the Atchison Hall in Castle Caulfield. So these are all the announcements I'd like to highlight, so just to hand over to Ivan to lead us in worship. Thanks, Ivan. You used to get arrested for doing that, putting a mask on. <laughs> good afternoon, folks. Thanks, Keith. It is good to be back in English. Uh, it's been a fair number of years since I was last here. Uh, I was the minister at one stage in Stewartstown, Albany and Bry. I'm currently the pastoral associate in First St. Field. Let's just take that moment of resting our hearts, stilling our hearts and our minds before we come to God. Let's just do that, please. <clears throat> The psalmist writes, You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And that's the God that we have. A God that helps us and allows us to dwell in safety. We're going to stand and sing, masks on, how lovely is thy dwelling place.
Let us pray. Almighty, awesome, sovereign God, King of the heavenly hosts, in your time you produced form where there was none. Over five periods of time, created by your word, everything that was necessary to be in place before physical human life was created. And we were created in your image. And Lord, we were created to be your watchful guardians over the rest of your creation. To be in that loving relationship with you. And how oh, how at times as we take all that in, we look around and we see the work of your hands, how hard it is to take all this in that those first five periods were put in place for us. You provided everything we required to sustain us. And when we turned our back on you as sinful, self-centered rebels, you didn't walk away. You wanted still to dwell amongst us, to be our Lord, to be our God. And then you took that one step further. It wasn't plan B, it was always plan A. And you give us the opportunity of spiritual new life through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. He died on that cross in our place. And then by your spirit, you have guided us through all kinds of hardships and trials. And Lord, we still at times forget who you are. And when we wander off to seek our own desires, through your spirit, you bring us back onto those right paths. Lord, we come and we give you thanks. We thank you that you are the only source of life, love, hope, and peace, now and forever. Amen. Our reading this morning is from John chapter 14. Nope, it's not Isaiah 9. John chapter 14, and we're reading the verses Mark 15 to 31. It's all right, we can still read it. Let us read God's word. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you will also live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You hear me say I'm going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens. So when it does happen, you will believe. 
I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. But the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come, now, let us leave. Amen. We know that God will bless this reading from his word. Let us pray. Speak, O Lord. As we open up your word, we pray that we would be aware of what you're saying. Open our eyes that we may see you. Open our ears that we may hear you. Open our hearts that we may love as you love. And open up our minds and our lives that we would know you and live for you. Amen. Peace. I'm tempted to show, have I missed one? You're right. Thank you. We are actually going to stand and we're going to sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
Go away and give my head peace. It would be nice to have some peace and quiet around here. But you be still. I need some peace. And everything seems to be moving at breakneck speed. There's not enough time in the day for everything. And those speech quotations are becoming, I think, more regular. Or when someone mentions peace, you watch, you listen to the news. The tensions between Russia, Ukraine, and the rest of the world. Tensions amongst Muslims in the Gulf region. Tensions around Europe due to ongoing COVID restrictions. The continual bickering of the children of Stormont, sorry, or MLS. <laughs> and maybe these are our thoughts. What does peace really feel like? Are we still aiming for world peace in our time? And let us just think, what is peace? What is real peace? Everyone is searching for P. E A C E. And I, I suspect with different ideas of what it looks like. And I wonder, at times we will ask, is there such a thing as real peace, lasting peace? As we look back over the years, and some will remember more events than others, depending on the number of birthdays you've had. And we see peace promises. We see agreements. And they're made, and they're broken. And they're made, and they're broken. And in case we haven't got used to it, they're remade, and they're rebroken. And that happens, and we're having that thought that what some folks are calling peace isn't truly what I think it should look like. So seriously, what do you think? What comes to mind when you think of P-E-A-C-E? -E? In our reading, Jesus speaks in verse 27 of chapter 14 of a peace that we won't find in this world. He speaks of his peace, a peace that is personally given to Christians, to his disciples, his apprentices. Have we ever thought and stopped and realized that's what we're called to be? We're called to be apprentices, learning on the job. And Jesus is preparing to go to the cross and with his initial disciples around him, he declares in verse 6 who he is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. 7 to 14, he sets out his relationship between him and his father. And then from 15, which we read, there's the promise of the Holy Spirit coming. And he's saying that those who love him keep his commandments, his teachings by their actions and in verses 21 23, he says, they will be loved by his Father. They will know the blessing of learning, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And they will know his peace. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. You know, friends, these aren't just words. They're not words to ease the pain of him going away. They aren't just words for those 12. This is the promise of a personally given peace. A personally given peace to those who truly love him, who are loved by God. And this is a peace spoken of in that second part of that verse, verse 27. It says, I do not give to you as the world gives. It's a peace that the world doesn't know. It's a peace that's not available within Society. And it comes, it's a peace that comes with a spiritually empowered healing. We, we all know that worldly peace is not dependable. It's likely to hurt more when it fails. And yes, and we sit and we wait for that to happen because that's what we expect. And we know when it happens. There'll be more brokenness. And the brokenness we are experiencing, the fearfulness, Jesus comes and he says, but my peace, you don't have to be afraid. With worldly peace, it's never going to last. With my peace, you do not have to, because your heart won't be broken. You see, 
Everything earthly, everything worldly lasts for a short period of time. Well, not everything. Openness to hurt, to pain, may be hidden, but it can't truly be healed. It can't be taken away. It's going to happen. And when we live without God, when we live ignoring all that Jesus' death and resurrection offers us, then we continue without that peace, that in part healing. And we will only know when the hostility between our sinful lives and the holy, holy purity of God is removed. The coming of the Holy Spirit that Jesus talks about in verse 26 provides us with a power to be free from a sinful hurt and pain of this world. Through the Holy Spirit, we've been empowered, enabled. I was speaking to a friend uh, at the beginning of the week just past. They were brought up in an abusive family set up, abused from a very young age by their father, left home as quick as they could, and 40 years later, as a parent, they went back to meet, which they thought was possibly because of the state of their father's illness. And as they stood there, they said that all those years those 40 years seemed to have disappeared from the, the father's responses. And it didn't hurt them anymore because they stood there with a heavenly father. And they said that when they left, they realized they had his peace because they were no longer afraid of what was coming. And you see, through the Spirit, we have been in part, we are enabled. Because this peace, we will only know when our sins are forgiven. And that friend was saying they knew it. They never believed that it was possible until they were in that situation. And when we personally know the peace of Jesus that is personally given, the peace that brings in part healing, then we know that we have become adopted children of God. What, a, what an amazing inner peace we can have. Knowing that we can come to God as his child. We can come with whole loving affection, confidence and trust. Because this is way beyond anything, as our friend said, that a earthly father-child relationship could bring. We have a heavenly father. We are adopted children. Jesus is 24 hours away, remember, from being crucified. He knew what was coming. And yet his concern was for us. That's 2,000 years ago. It was for his followers. If we read John 17, we see him praying and giving thanks for what he was going to do. We see him praying for those around him. But then from verse 20, we see him praying for us. For those who will come. And that was his concern. And from a human perspective, we could say... Why isn't he focusing on his suffering? Why is he having concern for followers? That just doesn't make sense. Well, it's easy. You see, Jesus had that peace. It came from his direct connection and relationship with his father. And we see by these verses that the greatest desire of Jesus the Son is to complete the mission that his father has given to him. And that mission is to go to the cross. That's how he fulfills his mission, by going to the cross and dying for us. And he knows that is what's going to save his people. He knows that's what it's going to take. And that's what he came to do. And as long as his relationship with his father was intact, so was his peace. As long as our relationship to the Son exists, so does our peace. It comes through him, directly from the Father. And we are living, we are called to be living for the Son, glorifying the Father. 
Remember, friends, Jesus doesn't create peace for us. What he does is he lets us in on the peace he has based on that relationship between Father and Son. In verses 23, 24, Jesus is saying anyone who loves him will be carefully keeping his word, living it. And that he and his father will be in a relationship with that person. You know, if we weren't Presbyterians, we'd probably shout hallelujah. But we are Presbyterians, so we don't say anything. But wow, can you imagine that? There's that linking together, accepting, living, Jesus saving grace. Filled with the Holy Spirit, being adopted into the Father's family. Inner peace, directly from that relationship. God's peace. Not man's peace, God's peace. Why? Because we're in a relationship with God. And we live in a world that wants to be in a close relationship with God. On their conditions. Within their comfort zones. Using the means they feel is necessary. Doing their best. But let's think about that. If it was possible to do it on our conditions. Within our comfort zones. Doing our best. We wouldn't have Christmas. Christmas. Just think of all the bills we wouldn't have to build up. No Christmas, no Easter. No Easter, you wouldn't be here this morning. And some of you might think that would be a good idea because you wouldn't have to listen to me. But there's no need for Jesus to be here at all. And I find that sad. Don't I find sad? I find it sad when I hear adults who won't accept Jesus as Savior praying the Lord's Prayer. Because without realizing that they don't have a heavenly Father, because without Jesus, they aren't God's children. And unless we are God's children, we can't have his peace. Being his children isn't putting your hand up in a meeting and say, yes, please. It's living and being apprentices, as I said at the start. And that is the peace we all need. It's a peace that provides that real inner contentment, no matter what this world will throw at us. It's fixed and it's stable, no matter what the circumstances. And even when we find ourselves in the middle of deep distress, deep chaos, and when the kids come, back, come in later, you will have the opportunity of making chaos and making distress for everybody else. But when we have that real contentment, I understand it's achieved when we're at ease, body, mind, and soul. And we won't find that anywhere but in Christ. You see, when we know multiple heartbreaking events, when you've gone through serious personal illness, experience serious illness in somebody else, bereavement of a loved one. That's the real test of our faith. I've been there. That's the time when you claim that the sovereign God is sovereign. And it can be easy to say words or to nod in agreement, but at that moment, the only real peace we can have is in knowing contentment. In Jesus. As a pastor, I've sat with individuals and their families as they face the reality of terminal illness, the stress, the chaos of bereavement. Over the last two years, COVID has caused separation. It has closed church doors. It hasn't closed the church, it has closed church doors. And the main question or statement that seems to come for a lot of people is what next? And the main question that I have is the condition of their soul. You see, later in John's Gospel in chapter 16, Jesus was still preparing his disciples for that future. And he says, this world will bring you many hardships, troubles, sufferings. And you know, what you must remember is that he has overcome this world. He has overcome everything the world will throw at us. 
Paul writing to the church in Philippi tells of a peace he knows. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. He had that contentment. And that contentment was eternal. You see, in his letter, we find him reminding people of his words in John chapter 5. Or sorry, in John 3, 16. We all know him. For God so loved the world. God gave his only begotten son. Why? So that whoever believes, believe isn't just that he exists. It's actually trust will have everlasting life. John 5 and 24. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. And Paul has those in his mind when he says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. You see, all of us, if we are true followers of Jesus, we are receivers of Jesus' free gift of eternal life. And isn't it something we have? It isn't something we have earned. It isn't something just for those special 12 initial people. This isn't something for those special super evangelistic preachers. Jesus states in John 10 that all his sheep, that's us, we're included in there. If we're believers, if we're apprentices, we are his sheep. We are firmly held in his Father's hand. And nothing, no one can ever, through all eternity, remove us from that secure position. Trials will come. I'm not saying because you have Christ that everything is rosy in the garden. Mind you, I once said that it will be rosy in the garden. You will have a bloom and you'll have a scent for a period, but the thorns will be there forever. And that will, the world will hate us and the world will throw everything. But our eternal connection to the Son of God is permanent, eternally permanent. And there from the moment we accept Jesus as our Redeemer, as our Savior, as our Lord, so is our peace. As we conclude, let, let me lovingly ask you a question. When we sang that hymn that I finally skipped, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Were, were those just words that we sang? Or was that a heartfelt declaration along with your testimony in the rest of the hymn? We're going to shortly be singing again. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. And that will be our, an acknowledgement of our joy and the experience of a blessed peace. And I wonder, will they be just words we're singing? Or will that be that peace we know as we lean safe and secure in everlasting arms. Dear friends, I pray that it is. Let us pray. Lord, as we think of your word, as we try to take in everything that it is saying to us, and the availability of that peace, that perfect peace that we can only have through you, Lord Jesus, because it's your Father's peace given to you, passed on to us. Lord, we pray that we would surrender our, our sense of looking at this world and being disappointed and pulling that in, thinking it couldn't be real. Lord, we thank you that your peace is real. And we pray that we would know that. And that the words that we sing won't be just words. They will be coming from our soul, from our hearts, bursting out our belief. Lord, we think of those who can't be here this morning. And we offer up our prayers for them. We think of Mark and Claire and the children. We think of others within our congregation, within our community, that have been smitten by COVID. 
those that have gone through that experience and have longer lasting illnesses. Over the last two years of those whose families have been hit by it and we have lost loved ones. And Lord, we pray that they would know your presence, your peace. We think of those who are sitting, waiting on tests coming back. Those that are sitting with concerns and worry because of tests that they have to do. Those that have had results and the news on a, a physical level may not seem good. And Lord, we pray that they would know your comfort. They would know your presence around them. They would know your peace. Lord, we pray for those who within our friendships, within our families, within our community, continually have that pain, that gap of a bereavement. Lord, teach us how we can reach out and to walk alongside them as you walk alongside us, to be there as you are for us. And Lord, with so much there that you have given to us, we come and we give you thanks. We come with our gifts and we hand them back to you. And we pray that you will bless them and teach us to use them for the advancement of your kingdom. In your son's name, amen. We are going to stand and sing, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. It's good to have the children in with us from Sunday school. I'm going to look at a Bible story. And it's about Jesus and his disciples. And I need you 
can't hide away up there because I need you to help me. I need you to do something for me. And not only do I need the children who are sitting up in the balcony, I need, you ready for it? I need the children who are sitting downstairs. Yes, you may laugh, but every one of us are children. We may think it's a long, long time ago. Let me, I remember once going into a meeting and a friend says to me, remember, age has nothing to do with the number of birthdays. It's just a state of mind. And when the meeting was over, he said, what did I tell you? And I said it to him. And his response was, didn't we see that in that meeting? We saw teenagers and you thought they were pensioners. Even worse, we had pensioners and I thought they were children. <laughs> what I want you to do, the ones sitting down search don't need to. Children, I, I would like you to stand up. Please. And what I would like you to do is, whenever I do that, Okay, I want you to clap your hands and stamp your feet. Do you think you could do that? Come on, try it. Will the balcony fall or is it safe? It's okay, Jeff. Good. Okay, let's try that. Go on. Come on, downstairs too. Come on. Okay. Right. Whenever I do that, I want you just to clap your hands. Okay? So... Brilliant. And whenever I do that, I want you to stop immediately. Do you think we could try that? Let's go. Let's see. Brilliant. This story is about Jesus in a boat. Okay. And what we've just done, if you could do that in your life, wouldn't it be fantastic? As I was coming, I was starting to rain. And last night, I could hear buckets and stuff around my house blowing about. Well, not around the house. Well, they were the right side. And, well, they were beside the door earlier in the evening. And they're down the bottom of the garden at the end of the evening. Because, yeah. All that storm was going, and it eased off a little bit, but it was still there. And if we could just do that with the weather, wouldn't that be amazing? To go outside and the weather's going. Or maybe it's just a little. And we could stand up and go. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Well, that's exactly what Jesus did in our today in our story. He's in that boat that men with him are fishermen. They knew all about how to handle a boat. They knew about having to outweigh waves. But this was a big storm. This was really common. And there was wind and there was rain and there was big waves. And they started to get worried. And they were so afraid they didn't know what to do. And it eased a little bit but it was still there. And they went, and do you know where Jesus was? He was down in the bottom having a sleep. All this was going on. And he was lying sleeping. And they thought, come on, everybody's got to help. And they woke him up. And they said, we need you to help us. And he said, quiet, peace. And it suddenly happened. He told the waves, quiet, peace. And it was calm. There was stillness on the water. You know, this story demonstrates for us God's amazing power. But it also reminds me of some other... uh, If we feel worried, if we feel frightened, we feel scared. And if somebody here says, I have never felt worried, frightened, or scared. I'm sorry, they're telling lies. We've all felt worried, frightened, or scared at some time. Well, let me tell you, Jesus 
curse about us. He's in control. And when it seems as though he's asleep in our boat, and everything inside us is going... Yeah. Or even just slightly turmoil. Jesus can come and he can stop it because he cares. And when we pray and we put our trust in him, his power can calm our hearts. It can settle our nervous minds. And he can bring us an everlasting peace. He still the worries that threaten us. And we have to ask him for help, for hope, for guidance. We've got to put our trust in him. I'm going to pray. And I want you to repeat with me, please. Because when things are rough, remember Jesus is there in the boat with us. And we can trust him. And he will calm the storms in our life. Let's just pray. Dear God, Thank you for being in control. You can calm the weather and the waves in our lives. And you can bring peace to my troubled heart. Thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for loving me. And help me to trust in you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your... And thank you. We are going to stand and sing. And those that have to will wear a mask. The Lord's my shepherd and I will trust in you alone. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through 
Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.